y partners para hacer los centros de datos más inteligentes. Entonces voy a cubrir, um, voy a cubrir, voy a empezar por decir cuáles son los problemas uh, en los centros de datos hoy, hoy en día. Um, y la transformación que, que está pasando uh, en el mundo, en el, los centros de datos, uh, empezando con uh, computing de nubes, eh, y de ahí voy a hablar de Integrated Service Management, eso sí que no sé cómo decirlo en español. Um, y qué estamos haciendo con los sistemas en la IBM y, bueno, el, la industria uh, entera, la tendencia de la industria entera, para hacer los sistemas más fácil para emplear uh, faster time to value y para mantener. Cada, creo que son dos años, uh, el presidente de la compañía hace un, uh, un, un estudio de los CIOs y CEOs de, de los clientes de, de la IBM. Y the feedback that we've received from these studies is 85% of distributed computing um, is sitting idle, is, is not fully utilized. Um, 82% of these CIOs report that they've had security breaches uh, in their infrastructure, meaning a hacker has hacked into the infrastructure. Um, and 70% of the money spent in the data center is, is really spent on maintaining the current infrastructure instead of going after additional value. So um, we're going to look at some of the issues with this. I'm going to first start with um, what are clients wanting, right? So w w when we talk to clients, I, I spend personally como la mitad de mi tiempo con clientes y la otra mitad de mi tiempo trabajando con el grupo de de redes de centros datos que tenemos en IBM. Um, y the feedback that we get from clients is clients want to understand how cloud computing can transform the business. Um, they want to maintain security, so the security problems that I said in the previous page, they want to not, not have those problems. They want a platform that is very simple to manage, that's very simple to bring up, so that when you buy it, you can get it up and running very quickly. Kind of like a personal computer or a notebook. When you buy a notebook, you just turn it on and it works. I'll show you that in a lot of data centers, when you buy a system, you don't just turn it on, you have to load software into it, you have to update it, etc. cetera. Um, and they want to do all of that for a lot less. So I'm going to start with an example of today's data center. Um, this picture is very ugly, and you talk to clients. When I when I talk to clients, I um, I've met with you know financial clients, Wall Street clients, um, service providers, Orange, Portugal Telecom. They have similar issues. They have similar problems in their data center. The data center looks that ugly. Um, this is an example. Some of them actually laugh and say, mine's actually a lot worse than this picture. Um, let, me, let me give you some examples of, this, of, of the problems that are in this picture. When one of these servers wants to talk to somebody that's on the internet, they have to go through several layers of switches. Those switches, each of them add latency. And those links today in most data centers are a gigabit. They're migrating to 10, but most of them are a gigabit. So they have to go through all those layers. Then they have to go through the DMZ, the service plane that does security, that does IDP, that does firewall, and then finally out into the router, into the internet. And if you make a transaction with one of these web tier servers, and they have to talk to the application tier server, that goes all the way up into this 
zone and all the way back with all of that latency. So it's very expensive, lots of tiers, many fabrics. Every switch in the network repeats all the processing. Um, and it's very manual to manage. You have many managers in this picture that are managing servers, that are managing the switches, the storage, et cetera. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, the three, three things that we see that, that are changing this data center infrastructure. One of them is cloud computing. The second one is service management, which enables cloud computing. And then to provide these systems that are much faster to come up and run and easier to maintain uh, integrated systems. So what constitutes a smarter data center infrastructure? So from, from our vantage point, there's three, three parts to it. Part one is cloud computing. And that consists of analyzing the workloads that run in the data center, determining which ones make sense to put it in a public cloud versus a you know, private cloud versus being able to use a, a public cloud when your data center infrastructure gets overloaded and switch over to that. And then the service management software that enables that cloud, that application to move around in the cloud, to move from an internal private cloud to a public cloud, um, to provide that faster response time and lower the operational expenses. And then to simplify the systems, the purchase of multi-rack, uh, how many racks? Well, like a row of servers. Each one of those you know, racks there that's basically one rack. So imagine 10 of those in a row, packaged as one system and sold as one system, installed as one system with all the software um, in there so that you can get up and running very quickly and maintain that very simply. So let's start with um, how do you analyze these, you know, the workloads to determine, you know, that it makes sense to, do, to, to put them in cloud computing. Um, one thing is test for standardization. How standard is the workload? Um, uh, collaborative infrastructure, so you know, set of workloads that are basically very standard. Next, examine the risks. There are some workloads that are very risky. For example, high frequency trading. Um, so this is like uh, stock market trading. Um, databases is like you know, financial databases that run in the bank. Those kind of, you know, those kind of uh, workloads have a lot of risk to the enterprise. Those kind of workloads you might want to keep in a private cloud as opposed to putting them in a public cloud. And then new workloads, like analytic workloads or collaborative network workloads, where you might want to take advantage of the fact that it's a public cloud and you get much lower cost of operations from that public cloud. So there's a, as a, as, as I was saying a second ago, there's a spectrum of delivery models from keeping it completely private. Um, you provide it as a service. It's completely kept inside the enterprise. It's completely kept behind the firewall. So it, it's, a, it's difficult, more difficult for hackers to get into versus at the other end of the spectrum, a completely public cloud um, that's offered over the internet. And in between is, um, you know, we, we have some Wall Street clients that uh, when their peak load gets very high, what they'd like to be able to do is migrate some of the workloads and some of the applications from their data center into uh, an IBM data center. And that's what we mean here by the, by the middle one, the hybrid cloud. When we've talked to clients, um, what the feedback that we get is this, this set of application and database workloads you know, they, they pretty much view as keeping that inside the data center using a private cloud or a managed private cloud, whereas help desk, desktop virtualization, storage cloud, et cetera, more for you know, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure workloads that, that can be done in a public cloud. Um, why are clients you know, seeking this, you know, this cloud computing model and from our, and I'll, and I'll show you some of those results, I'll show you some examples of the feedback that we've gotten from customers of how much money they've saved in the slides that are coming up, is it's, it's much faster to do provisioning, uh, to do change management, release management in a cloud type environment. Um, 
the, ser the services are self-access, so you, you, you self-service, um, you provide that self-service to users, um, and it's much better utilization of the infrastructure because you can move the applications, you can move the workloads from overutilized servers to underutilized servers. So now the next three slides are going to talk about you know, what differentiates IBM in this cloud environment, and then I'm going to go into integrated service management and integrated systems. So one of them is um, proven economic value. Um, I'll, I'll show you examples of clients that we've worked with in cloud computing and how you know, they've gotten economic value out of implementing cloud computing, private and, and public. Um, number two is integrated and open. So instead of having closed standards that lock you in, that you know, don't let you move workloads around, lock you into a specific vendor's software, um, this is more about having standards and open software that you can move that workload around. Um, and it's across the entire infrastructure from the network you know, to the servers to the cloud computing software. Um, security, uh, we, we covered some of that already. Um, another thing that differentiates IBM is our global reach and um, the data centers that we manage. I'll, I'll show you a slide basically described, you know, showing how many data centers we have um, across the world and how much compute that is, how much storage that is, et cetera. And then this last part I'm going to get into is integrated service management and integrated systems and, you know, what we're doing here um, with current systems and the standards that we're working on, especially in the network area, that's the area I'm, I work in, um, to improve the, the, the infrastructure and make it more automated and easier to manage. So this is, this is some examples of clients that we have worked with across, uh, across the world um, and some of the benefits that these clients have told us that they've seen. Reduced um, IT labor cost by 50%. This is in terms of configuring the systems, um, operating them, monitoring them, moving uh, workloads around to underutilized servers, improved capital utilization um, by reducing uh, license costs, um, provision cycle, and, and the provision cycle is around being able to create a service in a service catalog. For example, what's a service, like a billing service? or an ordering service. Be able to create a billing service in a service catalog and replicate that so that you can have multiple virtual machines that are running that service and then move it between overutilized servers to underutilized servers. Um, much better quality, uh, less software defects, um, and uh, it reduced uh, IT support costs by, by 40%. So these are some of the examples of the value that clients have, uh, have achieved. This is an example, so I'm sort of going across those five, you know, from this slide here, right, from, from this slide, going across, you know, across here and describing um, what we're doing. So we're, we're in, we're, 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 we, we advocate standards-based approaches to cloud, to the integrated systems, to the software, to the, to the, to the network, the storage. And so you'll see uh, management, for example, the DMTF is a management standard group. Um, you'll see cloud uh, and open software uh, forums, as well as storage forums and, and uh, networking forums like IEEE 802 and, uh, and IETF for, for IP. Um, me personally, you know, if, if you want to ask some questions about what I do at the end of this, of this session, my focus is really in these two, uh, in these two areas here. Um, this is an example of our cloud labs. We have cloud labs in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, in Dublin. We, you pretty much see we have them across the world. And we have clients, you know, these, these are the, the clients that have used our infrastructure. Um, and you can pretty much see they're, they're also global clients. They're not just in the U.S. or uh, in Europe. Um, and in terms of the experience that we have for cloud, 
we, this, is, this is sort of an overview of how much computing we have in our data centers. We have 400 data centers around the world with 8 million square feet. Um, and if you look at, uh, you know, if, 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 if you look at how much compute and how much storage is in these data centers, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty wow. <laughs> 1,000, over 1,000 mainframes, uh, 100,000 terabytes, 300,000 images, that's virtual machines, um, on those servers, and uh, 13 million managed uh, desktops. By managed desktops, I mean, you know, notebooks or mostly notebooks. Notebooks and updating those notebooks, keeping the software releases, the operating system releases um, up to date. All right, so what I'm going to get into next is the data, the, the integrated service management, and then integrated systems. So uh, our integrated service delivery platform is called uh, IBM Service Delivery, ISDM. And what this, what this platform does is it, it, it basically provides three major software areas. One is it provides a, an automated service manager. And what that service manager lets you do is create for example, a billing service or an ordering service, um, and create that in a catalog that you can pull from that catalog, instantiate that service, and make it operational. Put it, uh, you know, uh, start it up and, 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 and use it. And then the Tivoli Usage and Accounting Manager, ITUAM, is used to basically meter that service so that you can charge the users of that service. So whoever's you know, using that, you can charge it for how much compute, you know, how much network, uh, and you can plan. You can, you, you, you've been using this much, you know, you, you, you were, your, your, you know, your budget is here, this is how much you're paying, you know, you're gonna need to increase the budget, for example. So you can use it for planning purposes. And then the last one is monitoring, to monitor the availability, monitor the performance, is it meeting the SLAs that um, that, that service you know, uh, guaranteed to the users? So I'm gonna basically take this integrated service management and, and go step by step. Um, so the self-service portal is what's used to basically you know, request a service. So you know, like I said, for ex the example of a billing service. Um, and then that service, once it's you know once it's created, it's put in a, in a it's it's pulled into a catalog. Um, there's a single repository for that, um, and it eliminates the manual processes because you're using it out of catalog as opposed to starting this entire configuration of the service from scratch. You're pulling it out of a a, 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 a catalog. Um, the two the two tools that I covered earlier, service automation and accounting. So the accounting tool you know, generates the billing, bills the clients for those services, um, and uh, you know, gives them visibility of, you know, why am I getting billed this amount? Well, you use this much compute. You know, we've tracked the compute. You've used this much compute. You've used this much storage. That's why you're getting billed the amount of money that you're getting billed for that service. So I'm gonna get into uh, integrated systems and our, our definition, our view of integrated systems is basically three, three major things. Now, there's an additional one that I'm going I'm to add on here at the end, but what it basically provides is an automated, converged, and virtualized infrastructure, okay, that's much faster uh, to get up and running and easier to maintain. Um, it does that through the use of an integrated platform manager um, that manages the hypervisors, manages the servers, the network, the storage, um, and optimizes the workload. And then I'll talk about scalable integrated systems, the trends in integrated systems, and then I'll, I'll finally talk about converged and virtual infrastructure and what we're doing with, um, with the network. So in, in, addition to, you know, in addition to all of this infrastructure, you also need to be able to integrate with that service management that I just talked about. And so that's what this optional service manager is, is API level integration so that you can integrate with that. So I'll start with, um, with integrated system trends and, and talk about our integrated systems. If you go back a decade, it was around a decade ago that 
blade systems came into existence. You go back a decade, um, this was the mode that everybody operated in. You, you got a room, a pretty large room, full of boxes. The boxes had servers, they had storage, they had the switches, cables, and it was the data center network administrator, server administrator, storage administrator. It was their job to put all of that together, unpack those boxes, get that all up and running, load the software, um, et cetera. Clients wanted something much simpler, so they, they sought integrated units that came packaged together. So, you know, a chassis, a blade chassis. And that happened about a decade ago. So about 10 years ago, we did these integrated systems. IBM did the blade center uh, system. And it comes prepackaged. It comes with the server, the storage, the network. It provides faster time to value. And some clients wanted a larger consumable unit. They wanted a rack. So they wanted 100 servers, um, plus the storage and the network. And so, so we delivered an iDataplex, which was our rack level integrated system. Clients are now asking, if you look at this, if you look at this survey that we did, um, we did this last year, we've done it twice. Um, and if you look at the survey, clients, a large percentage of clients are asking for um, investing heavily in these larger integrated systems that are multi-rack, four racks, 10 racks, multi-rack integrated systems that, are, that provide a converged infrastructure that automate the virtualization. And, and I'm gonna describe what we're doing in the network piece and I'll describe what we're doing in the systems to provide these multi-rack um, systems. So, our, our integrated systems offerings are, we start at the very bottom here with blade systems. Um, and like I said, we've been doing those for about 10 years. Um, and then the next step up is, is uh, iDataplex, which is a rack level integrated system. Um, goes up to 100 servers. And it ships with everything, including the management appliance for that integrated system. And then for multi-rack, there's basically you know, two options. And I'll describe those in a little bit more detail. At one end of the spectrum is you get the platform management and everything beneath. And then at the other end of the spectrum, which is this cloud end of the spectrum, you also get the service management infrastructure. So you get you know, the service catalog, the service automation, uh, service monitoring, all of that. So um, IBM Blade Center Foundation for Cloud is at that first end of the spectrum. It, it provides the network, the storage, the virtualized servers, uh, the, the virtual machine, the hypervisor, right? The operating system and the management. Um, it comes pre-integrated, it's built in the factory, okay? And so that makes it much easier to, for a client to install. Um, and, uh, and, and then at the other end of the spectrum is all of that, okay, all of that, plus the integrated service management, the Tivoli integrated service management that I described uh, earlier. This is an overview of, of the, 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 the blade systems uh, that, that we have, uh, along with our choices in, in 20, I should say 2011. Some of these are, are new. Um, so anyway, it's, we have, a range of blade systems from ones that are more oriented to branch office type environments to very high performance, you know, 10 gigabit, uh, multi, multi 10 gigabit uh, systems, IBM Blade Center H, with a pretty wide range of compute blades from x86 compute blades to, uh, you know, to power compute blades and a pretty wide choice of, of uh, networking options and storage options. You can choose 10 gigabit, you can choose uh, converged, you can choose fiber channel, um, and several options for the storage. Um, what I'm gonna show you now is an example of an IBM uh, optimized solution that's fully integrated, right, this, this entire stack. Um, this is a benchmark, it's called, the, the, the benchmark is stack, um, which I'll show you the results of the benchmark in the next page, and to run that benchmark, you basically, you, you need the, infra the network infrastructure. 
Um, you need adapters to connect to that infrastructure, the servers, and, and this high frequency trading platform. This high frequency trading platform is what the stock brokers use, okay, to monitor the stock market and make very fast trades based on, you know, data that they see coming in. Someone announces a, a financial report and they think the stock market's going to go down as a result of that. They want to be able to put in a trade very quickly before everybody realizes that the stock market is going to go down because of this. Or there's some news about, you know, the U.S. government can't, uh, you know, can't close this deal on the debt, the debt ceiling. So that's the kind of news that the, that, 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 that the software analyzes. So th this is what made the system compute. And these were the results that we got on the benchmark that's used for these high frequency systems. Um, this is a world, uh, it's a world record that we did with the 10 gigabit ethernet switch that was actually higher than, a, uh, than an InfiniBand. InfiniBand is this cluster network, um, four times as high uh, as 10 gigabit ethernet. This was InfiniBand QDR. Um, so it's four times as high in bandwidth, yet the performance, the latency, okay, of this solution was lower than the latency of that InfiniBand solution. And this, this standard deviation is jitter. And what that means is if you've got two, two customers, right, two people, and they're trading, you don't want Joe to get the, the, the info, the news, that the stock market is going to go down, make his trade faster than Mary. You want them to get it at the same time. If they get it at the same time, that means there's zero jitter. The latency is the same for both. If that's not zero, that means that, that there's jitter and Mary's getting her information faster than Joe, for example. Um, so, so that covered the system. The system also needs a, the, the, this, this integrated platform manager. For us, this integrated platform manager is director. Um, it manages servers, network storage, up to 1,000 resources. Um, virtual and physical, um, and then it upgrades, it, up, it integrates upward with, uh, with Tivoli. Um, it provides configuration, it provides monitoring, displays a topology of, of everything that's in the system, um, and it you know, monitors it, right? Monitors performance events, fault events. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into system networking. Um, and for system networking, I'm, the way I'm going to cover this is there's sort of some foundational capabilities that, that are sort of basic. You need um, high bandwidth, you know, 10 gigabit, 40 gigabit, 100 gigabit uh, infrastructure um, with very low latency. You need some of these data center features. Um, and then the next step up in terms of leveraging the infrastructure is converged fabrics. And I'll talk about... Um, what we did with partners, with Brocade and with Cisco, um, to provide this, uh, you know, converged uh, fabric that's much lower, uh, provides much lower capex because instead of having a fiber channel fabric and an Ethernet fabric, you have one, one data center fabric. And then how to simplify switch management, the trends that we see there, and then the trends that we see in automated virtualization, some of the problems that we saw, and what, we're, what we did about them. So I'll start with the foundational capabilities. Um, this, uh, how many are familiar with virtualization, hypervisors? Any? Okay, so we've been doing hypervisors, well, I want to say we've been doing it for 10 years, but the System Z people, the mainframe people, will say when you were a little kid, Renato, in 1960s, we were doing virtualization. So, so I can't say it's, it's been, you know, 10 years, but that's how long I've been, you know, really working on the stuff. Um, I worked on power um, in, in, in Austin, and one of the things that we did in power is we created this host Ethernet adapter that lets virtual machines share the adapter directly so that they don't have to go through the hypervisor, they don't have to go through software in order to get out, okay? Without that, these two virtual machines, when they wanna talk, 
out to the Ethernet port, they would have to go through the hypervisor and some software, a bridge, and then out into the, into the network. With this native I.O. virtualization, we put that into the adapter. We did that in May 2007, and we leveraged um, hardware that we had done for InfiniBand um, in uh, May two, uh, in 2002. Okay. Um, in, I think it was 2005, 2006, Microsoft came to us and said, we want to standardize virtualization, um, I.O. virtualization, native I.O. virtualization, um, and we'd like you guys to help us. So what, uh, I have friends, a lot of friends in the industry. I have a friend at HP. Uh, he's an HP fellow. Uh, his name is Mike Krauss. We've known each other for about 14 years. And I called Mike and I said, Mike, do you, do you see this as a problem too? Do you think that we need to do that? I mean, I personally wouldn't mind if we kept it to power for a little bit longer. He said, no, I, I think we need to solve this problem in the industry and we need to solve it in PCI adapters so that everybody, you know, everybody has this type of an approach. So we chaired this work group, uh, PCI IO virtualization work group. And what we did is we took all of the patents. Um, I personally have around 50. The IBM company probably has around 300, 400 patents on IO virtualization. And we contributed those patents to the PCI SIG. We described everything we did. We described everything we did in this host ethernet adapter. Um, and we, we led that. Now, we didn't, we didn't standardize the, the virtual switch that's inside these adapters. So I wanted to do that, Mike wanted to do that, but we couldn't because the PCI SIG is not where you standardize Ethernet. So what we did is, well, we'll talk about that later. I'll, I'll cover that in the slides that are coming up. In terms of the I.O., um, We've, we've, you know, we've led the industry on, on these technologies. We've led it on I.O. virtualization. We've led it on uh, conversions in 10 gigabit. We did converge uh, Ethernet in, in fiber channel over Ethernet in 2009. Um, and we, we drove a lot of these standards. We drove RDMA. RDMA is a clustering standard. What it lets you do is it lets you, so let me give you an example. With TCP IP, which is what you use when you transfer stuff over the web, Software has to get involved on the send. When something gets sent from a server or from you know, one notebook to another notebook, software has to get involved on the send side and software has to get involved on the receive side. What RDMA lets you do, remote direct memory access, is it lets you take the data and move it right from, right from the user space application like a database or you know, a game and bypass the operating system, go right into hardware, out into the network, and on the receive side, receive it directly into, into memory. Um, so, so, so that's, for data centers, that's real important for, you know, for notebooks, the, the delay path of going across the network, even with 10 gigabit, becomes a bigger issue. Um, PCIO virtualization, which I you know, just talked about, this virtual ethernet uh, bridging and, and virtual fabrics, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more and describe what those are. Um, and then protocols that enable virtual machines that when they move all the network state, the state that's in those switches uh, that are running in the network moves with it. So, you know, what VLAN that virtual machine is, is tied to, what access controls, how much bandwidth, rate limiting um, has been set for that virtual machine, all of that state information to move with that virtual machine. And then network convergence uh, protocols. So um, in the data center, in the data center, there are multiple, fab there, there have been for a long time, multiple fabrics um, that are used, one for storage, one for networking, one for clustering, one for management. And, you know, that's a lot of cost. That's extra switches, that's extra adapters, um, extra managers. And so we worked, uh, with Cisco, with, with Brocade, um, a whole bunch of companies to basically provide this converged infrastructure, these convergence enhanced ethernet and fiber channel over ethernet that can lower the cost because instead of having two networks, I could put my fiber channel traffic, I could put my uh, clustering traffic onto one, one network. Um, 
the standard's pretty mature, um, as are you know, fabric managers for it. It does require organizations to have to work with each other, the server network and storage administrators to work with each other. Now, um, the trends that we see, this is where we are today. We have in the, in the industry, you know, with IBM, with our partners, we, we have integrated systems that provide you know, ethernet and fiber channel converged at the access switch. So the access switch is you know, the switch that the servers plug into. Right? So out of that switch comes Ethernet and fiber channel. Um, the next step, which we're, we're in the middle of now, um, is to have the entire network be converged. Okay? Have uh, the server, the storage, all on one converged infrastructure. The problem with the approach that, that's there today um, is that when this server here wants to talk to that storage device there, even though they might be connected by the same switch, it has to go all the way out to this thing called a fiber channel forwarder, okay? And then all the way back. So the latency's high, um, it requires a lot more bandwidth, um, a lot more cost. So um, Cisco proposed this fiber channel data forwarder. Uh, we were asking for you know, a function like this, they made the proposal. Uh, we, we like this proposal, um, we supported them on it, and what it basically lets you do is when this server wants to talk to that storage device, he does so inside this rack. He, he doesn't have to go all the way out to um, an integrated switch. He, he can do it all in, in internal, uh, you know, uh, to that rack. So you don't need as much bandwidth out into that external switch, um, and it's much lower latency. Um, so this is just a plug of, you know, these are the solutions that we have. Uh, in 2009, this is what we offered. Um, this year in July, this month, back last week, we released a, a, an Emulex adapter that in addition to having uh, converged fiber channel over ethernet, it also supports that direct IO virtualization so that you can have multiple uh, uh, virtual machines share the adapter uh, directly. So now I'm going to take. A, I'm going to talk about the next step in, in in the network infrastructure and talk about the trends that we see and what we're doing um, in the future. So if if you go back, uh, probably more than a decade uh, before stacking was used, this is basically what the network looked like in a data center. You have these are physical switches, these are uh, virtual switches. The servers connect into those virtual switches. The virtual machines do, and you got to manage all of that. You got to manage hundreds of virtual switches and you got to manage, you know, all of those physical switches. So the first step in in simplifying the network management is stack that um, stack switches. And that happens within a single tier. So in a single tier, you stack all the switches, they become one big switch. The next step, which we're in the middle of now, we we uh, released and announced, announced and released uh, switches, uh, IBM switches that support the standard. It's a standard that we came up with. Um, and we worked with HP, we worked with Juniper. Um, and on this, in this case, because we needed to do this very quickly and because IEEE is completely open, we didn't patent this stuff. So normally I would patent you know, a whole bunch of this stuff. I didn't do it. I gave it away. Okay, so what I did instead of patenting for, for this stuff is I published it. I published it in data center conferences, made it all available um, without patents. What it lets you do is it, it, it lets you take the virtual switches and, and basically make them uh, transparent, make them look like a pass-through so that they become part of this stacked switch. So that takes, you know, 130 switches and turns them into one switch. The next step that we see, the next trend that we see is a flatter network. Um, I, can't go, I can't describe this too much because of IP. There is patenting going on here. Um, but what it basically consists of is flattening this infrastructure so that essentially think of it like stacking across tiers so that all of these switches and the next set of switches above them become one big switch, as well as all the virtual switches. 
and there's multiple paths. So instead of having a, you know, a spanning tree protocol limited network that has only one half of it active, it's got a clause network that has many paths between this tier and that tier. I'm going to talk about virtualization trends. Um, every two years in uh, 2000, no, every three years, 2006 and 2009, we, we asked clients, data center clients, can you let us run some monitoring code inside your server and monitor um, how many virtual machines you're running, how much CPU utilization they have, how much I.O. utilization, how much disk bandwidth they need, memory utilization. And, and then what we've, what we've done is we plotted that, okay, and we plotted, projected that uh, over time. So this is a single, you know, single two-socket server and how many virtual machines it would, it, it's hosting, okay? So how many operating systems are running in, a sing, in that single server? And in 2009, this was sort of the range up to like 50, you know, virtual machines. Going into 2014, 120. Now in cloud computing environments, some of, you know, some of the workloads there, you know, this can be even higher than that number, okay? Our observations are that as you increase the number of virtual machines in, in a server, there's a lot more traffic between those virtual machines talking to each other. So we need to optimize that, uh, that traffic. Um, the other thing that's probably more important is it becomes more and more complex to manage because each of those virtual machines has a VLAN, has um, ACLs, traffic controls, et cetera, that when, it, when that virtual machine moves around, all of that state has to move with it. So um, our view is that we think the network is going to, you know, to this sort of a state at the end here. Let me describe the states. Um, if you go back 10 years in the x86 space, not systems, not mainframes, the x86 space, um, the workloads were very static. You, don't have, you didn't have to worry about a server, a computer, growing legs and walking from one end of the data center to the other end of the data center. That wouldn't happen. So you configure, the network administrator configured the virtual machine, one, the, the network once, and he didn't have to worry about servers moving around. It was a very simple, static network, very nice and neat for the network administrator to manage. Virtualization sort of changed that. What virtualization said is, what virtualization did is, virtual machines now can move from server A to server B. So virtual machines can come up and start running a new service, like a billing service or an ordering service, very quickly. So the workload becomes dynamic. You need to be able to move it around Okay, and what people started doing was doing, you know, for example, stack migration where this set of switches all share the state and the virtual machine can move across any of those servers and any of that state in those physical switches, it's shared. So no problem. That doesn't support a whole data center. A data center that has, you know, 10,000 servers, um, eight switches, that'll maybe support 100 or 122. Um, so that's, we came up with this QBG protocol uh, in IEEE. Um, and, and what it lets you do is it lets you move all of that network state anywhere in the data center. But you still got to program all that network state in that physical network, and you got to program it in the virtual machine. So you still got two networks that you've got to manage as a network administrator. So what we think is, you know, the next wave here is an overlay network where all the way to the virtual machine, all the way to the virtual machine, you have, you, you, you basically provide a, an overlay network on top of that physical network. So that physical network becomes kind of like this one. You configure it once, you configure it to the physical server. It only sees MAC addresses and IP addresses of physical servers it doesn't see MAC addresses and IP addresses of the virtual servers because that overlay network is hiding all of that, okay? 
Uh, that's not supported by VMware today. It's not supported by Microsoft today, but that's the trend that we see. So that, this, this virtualized network makes it very simple for the network and administrator to manage. It also provides the following two things. One is more efficiency for consolidated servers. So if you've got, let's say you've got, um, you've got the server here, it's running an application virtual machine, a database virtual machine, a web virtual machine, and this application server needs to talk to the web server. The way it works today with, with a layer two switch, like VMware or Microsoft or even ours, you have to go all the way out to that external switch and all the way back into the server. With an overlay network, that becomes a layer three switch. So the fact that you're crossing subnets, not a problem, that's a layer three switch. You'll do that cross subnet communication completely inside the server. The second thing that it buys you, which is probably a lot more important in, in cloud environments, is the ability to have two networks with completely overlapping IP address spaces all the way into the server so that you can have, for example, a, a Pepsi network and a Coke network running on the same server, and they can assign the same exact IP address to different virtual machines. So, you know, Pepsi can assign that IP address to a, one virtual machine, and Coke can assign the same IP address to a different virtual machine. And the fact that those addresses are overlapped, that's taken care of by this uh, overlay switch. So that's basically it. Um, I, I hope I you know, described how uh, these integrated systems automate data center workloads, um, what we're doing with virtualization, what we're doing in terms of driving these standards, and, uh, and uh, uh, how we're reducing the cost of uh, managing uh, data center infrastructure. Any questions? Microphone. ¿Qué tal, Renato? Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Eh, soy un IBMer. Muchos de aquí que también trabajamos en la empresa. Al cierto, uno de los 60 IBM Fellows, creo que te vemos como un semidios, porque eh, tú eres de las personas que desarrollan lo que todos los demás vendemos. Y lo que hoy te quiero preguntar es, aquí que está sentado el futuro tecnológico de México, y tú como una de esas personas que ha llegado tan lejos, eh, ¿qué consejo eh, les tienes? Eh, algo que les pueda servir de inspiración para que ellos se, se reten a sí mismos y lleguen quizá algún día donde tú estás. Uh, ok. Um, primero, eh, voy a hablar de patentes. Um, cuando, voy a tener que hablar en, en, en inglés unas cuantas palabras. Um, no sé cómo decir, don't give up. No te rindas. <risa> Perdón. Uh, cuando yo empecé, a, con mi primer patente fue en el 1995, creo que fue. Y me pasé como, como una semana trabajando con un abogado en ese patente. Una semana. Cuando terminé el patente, Dije, más nunca en mi vida voy a hacer otro patente. Por el resto de mi vida no voy a hacer más nada. Porque no me voy a gastar 40 horas de mi vida por IBM te da nada a los empleados. Creo que son 1.500 pesos por patente. En el en este tiempo creo que era 1.750. Pero 40 horas por, por 1.750 más, olvídate, no voy a hacer. No, no va a pasar. Bueno. Eh, cuando empecé a trabajar en Infiniband eh, 
conocí a, 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 un, a un señor un nivel más alto que, que yo en, en, en ese tiempo y, y él me dijo, oye, he, he leído de Finipan, he leído que tiene muchos, que, que ustedes están inventando mucho en Infinipan. Y, sí. y me dijo, ¿cuántos patentes tienes con Infinipan? Yo digo, ninguno, porque esta fue mi experiencia con los patentes. Y él me, me, fue un mentor para mí, eh, no sé si está bien dicho, mentor. Eh, me dijo, me explicó cómo reducir esas 40 horas a una hora. Y, y con eso pude eh, desarrollar eh, como 30, 40 patentes en Infinibam, con los tips que él me dio. Entonces, eh, lo que le quiero decir es que tener un mentor, buscar un mentor, um, que, que, que pueda ayudar, que te pueda decir, mira, si usted sigue en esta calle, en esta forma, eso no va a resultar en una cosa buena para usted. Es mucho más fácil si camina por este otro uh, path. Uh, y eso me ayudó mucho. Um, otra cosa es no pares de aprender. Yo todavía estoy aprendiendo. Y don't be afraid to make mistakes. Because some people, they make mistakes. And when they make a mistake, they go, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to speak anymore. I'm not going to say things anymore. Pero si yo hago un error, bueno, soy humano. Yo no soy Dios. Yo solamente soy un humano. Y voy a hacer muchos errores. OK. Mañana hago la, aprendo por el error que he hecho. Y Unfortunado, ashamed. Y no tengo shame por eso. Otra pregunta. Gracias, buenas noches. Me gustó mucho su plática. Buenas noches. Este, bueno, mi pregunta es básicamente, ¿cómo mejoramos la seguridad en una, en una virtualización de ese tipo? De un MyBrain, ¿seguimos utilizando capa 3 o nos vamos ya a la capa 4? Eh, para la seguridad, sí, seguridad. En la seguridad tienes dos opciones, en mi opinión, en mi sí, opinión, sí, sí. Okay. En mi opinión, en, en, este, eh, en este futuro, porque esto no, esto no existe todavía, este tipo de sistema no existe, pero en este futuro puede poner las uh, aplicado, appliances, no sé cómo decir appliances, aplicación dispositivos, puedes poner los dispositivos eh, en los servidores, dispositivos como ejemplo un firewall o intrusion prevention appliance en el servidor. La IBM tiene un virtual uh, security uh, appliance, virtual security server um, que runs on top of VMware. So it runs on top of VMware y Todas las máquinas uh, virtual machines, cuando hablan, pasan por el security appliance y el security appliance hace uh, IDP, etc. Entonces, esa es una opción. La segunda opción es en, el, en la, la capa, la capa es la parte de arriba, ¿no? La capa del de, de, de red adentro del centro de datos, poner uh, appliances de seguridad. Uh, firewall, IDP, etc. Pero tiene que ser mucho más grande. Um, uh, Juniper, por ejemplo, tiene una que es como, creo que son como 15 rack units, bien grande, que, que hacen todo eso pa, para todas las comunicaciones que van para afuera y para adentro. Esas son las dos opciones que, que yo veo. Buenas noches, muchas Buenas noches. gracias por la plática. Yo le quería preguntar, ¿cuál es el futuro que usted le ve a IBM? Por decir, ahora con la máquina de Watson, el acuerdo que tienen ahora con Nintendo para hacer los chips de Wii U. ¿Qué es lo que usted ve en el futuro para IBM? Um, 
it, it's a very large spectrum that IBM plays in. A, a corto plazo. Okay. En, en la área mía, en la área mía, eh, el futuro que nosotros vemos es para, tiene que ver a, a hacer sistemas que son más fáciles para las personas a ponerlo en, en uso. En, en lugar de, de, de una semana o dos días o un día, poder hacer el sistema uh, bring up the system very fast, very quickly. Not just one rack, like that rack, but 10 racks. And you imagine 10 racks, just connecting everything together is a pain, let alone running the virtual machines on them, monitoring those virtual machines. That's the challenge that, that you know, we think is, um, well, at least in the area that I work in, is very important to solve. Um, and for us, that means integrating the entire system, the application, the middleware, um, you know, application servers, and, that, and the entire hardware and software uh, stack. So that's my view. Now, the guy that's doing Watson, he'll, he'll give you a completely different answer. He'll, but that's my, my area. Any other? Buenas noches, este, muy buena práctica por cierto. Eh, en cuanto a IBM con las empresas mexicanas, ¿cómo se está eh, adaptando IBM con la nueva tecnología de IPv6 que está entrando a México? En, este, en Europa, Asia, eso ya es un hecho la, el cambio. Pero en cuanto a México, ¿cómo está haciendo ese cambio en las empresas que están manejando IBM? Um... ¿De qué clase de, de, qué, pero qué clase de, de computador? Es que... la, la transición de los data centers, de, de IPv4 a IPv6 en los data centers de IBM que estás manejando. No estoy... I'm not familiar with, with, with that. I'm sorry. Oh, IPv6. Ahora sí que mi mamá me mata si estuviera aquí. <laughs> Perdóname. <laughs> ok, IPv6. Um, wow. We, we've implemented IPv6 in, in, in all of our operating systems. So we've done it on, uh, you know, on AIX. Um, we've done it in the switches. So our switches, you know, support IPv6. The challenge with IPv6 is the infrastructure that, that's out there already. And IPv6 has, you know, uh, IPv4 encapsulation mechanisms. I, I'm not familiar with them. I, I didn't work on any of those standards. But they have in the IPv6 protocol, IPv4, I don't think they call it encapsulation. It's IPv4, and I don't think they call it tunneling. It might be tunneling. Um, so that you can take an IPv4 network that's all IPv4, And if you want to move into an IPv6 network, carry those IPv4 addresses across that IPv6 network, which is you know, part of the challenge of migrating to IPv6. You're not going to rip out everything in your infrastructure and put brand new infrastructure in. So you need to be able to take IPv4 servers and transit you know, on, on, ingre on egress the packets. And as they cross from an IPv4 to an IPv6, carry that IPv4 address and the IPv6 so that when there's another IPv4 network on the other side, y you can carry it into it. I, I think that's the, the, the way that IPv6 handles uh, IPv4 addressing across it, but you can look at it in the RFC. The RFCs in IETF, the IPv6 RFC. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Este, creo que las otras empresas que ya tienen este esta pequeña idea, bueno, no la tienen muy desarrollada, pero ¿cree que le afecta a IBM que ellos estén desarrollando algo similar? Por decir, Oracle, que ya tiene su propia máquina virtual. Uh, Oracle no he visto hablar nada de, de este tema, de este tema que acabo de cubrir. Uh, no he ido a hablar. Oracle sí tiene con Sun virtual machines, hypervisors. Um, and they're catching up. I say catching up because nosotros fuimos los primeros que, 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 que pudimos hacer uh, native IO virtualization um, before they did. Um, 
that's the mechanism that lets virtual machines talk to each other directly through hardware, not going through software. So, um, so yes, there are, there's Oracle, there's VMware, there's, there's other companies with virtualization. Um, and in terms of the management, we have to manage them all. So that integrated service manager, we have customers that say, I like IBM, for example, I like IBM power systems, but I want to buy, I don't know, somebody else's, I'm not going to say a name, somebody else's x86 servers. So we, we have to manage all of them. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Este, usted mencionó dos áreas en las que se especializa. Eh, me la, saber. Las áreas que yo especializo son, uh, que he trabajado son uh, transport layer, network transport layer and servers, um, I.O., server I.O., um, and more recently converged fabrics and virtual fabrics. Oh. <laughs> Hola, buenas noches. Buenas noches. La pregunta que tengo es, ¿qué tanto es la curva de aprendizaje cuando se desarrolla hardware como esto hacia la programación que tienen estos, ¿Qué? bueno, con la que se tiene que programar los, los equipos? ¿Qué? No te entendí, perdóname. Cuando se desarrolla este hardware, Ajá. ¿qué tanto le cuesta o cuál es la curva de aprendizaje a los, oh, al, al, equipo, al equipo de desarrollo para sí. poder alcanzar o aprovechar bien esta tecnología que se está implementando? Eh, eh, me está preguntando cuánto, se de, cuánto tiempo se, se, es para desarrollar una idea nueva, ¿no? Um, to, to make them or to use them. ¿Para hacerla o para usarla? Para hacerla. Mm. Me luce que, por ejemplo, eh, el transporte de, de, de clusters, ¿no? Um, es una cosa que se puede... You can take a class. Un amigo mío uh, de IBM escribió un libro, uh, se llama Greg Fister. Es en inglés, pero es un libro que si, si lo puedes leer en inglés, uno se ríe leyendo el libro. Es bien fácil de, de, de aprender el, eh, el tema en un semestre, por ejemplo. <laughs> you got a mic. Uh-oh. There you go. Are you designing another things like protocols or another layers? Um, the latest protocol that, that I designed was, uh, was QBG. Um, and it was three protocols in QBG. And like I said, QBG, I didn't patent any of that. I just gave it away. And the three protocols um, were, I don't want to give you the details, but, but the main protocol was when this virtual machine comes up, okay, before, before you get it up and running, the hypervisor tells the switch, I'm bringing the ordering service up. Take the ordering service VLAN, access control, blah, 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 and put it on the switch so that when this virtual machine comes up, it's all there on the switch. That is what we came up with and, and, and standardized. There's protocols for this, but we're not standardizing that yet. We're, this, is under de, this is under development. Any other questions? Este, este tipo de temas a simple vista parecieran muy complejos. ¿Qué le diría usted aquí a varios varios jóvenes que tal vez estén interesados pero que no se animan ¿Qué, ¿cuál sería su manera de decirles que se motiven a, a adentrarse a este tipo de temas? Um, empieza con las aplicaciones uh, em, em, empiezas con cloud computing and cloud service management 
Um, me imagino que aquí en, en, en México, eh, en las universidades, pueden cubrir esos, esos temas. Y es una, es una área que se usa en el mundo entero. No, there isn't pockets of development for it. <laughs> una última pregunta. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Eh, hablaba al principio de su presentación que cuesta eh, 70 centavos de cada dólar mantener un sistema actual, por así decirlo. ¿Por qué es tan caro? Eh, ¿No eh, funciona actualmente eh, o qué es lo que pasa? Es administrar el red, los servidores, los uh, virtual machines, el almacenaje. Todo esto, la administración de todo eso, eso es lo que, lo, lo que cuesta el 70% administrando todo eso. Si, si en un centro de datos que tiene 10,000 servidores, no me acuerdo el failure rate, pero muy regularmente va a haber discos que, que se van a romper, que hay, que hay que cambiarlo. Tiene que entonces no solamente cambiar el disco, no solamente es el, el cuesto de, esa, de la laminación del, del disco ese, sino todos los servidores que estaban usando ese disco, they now have to switch over. If there was a virtual machine running on it, 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 it has to switch over. Or if a server dies, it has to switch over. So that's part of the, you know, part of the cost. The other part is it's very complicated. The, the management today is too complicated. And that's something that we're working to, to, to improve and, and simplify. Ok, muchas gracias. Bueno, en nombre de la campus, eh, le extiendo unas gracias al señor Renato Recibo. Muchas gracias. Gracias.